name is Candy Birch with the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. Welcome to Let's Talk Issues, a public service program co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters, the Kansas City Star, and Johnson County Community College. Tonight's topic is Going Green in Kansas City. Here to, to introduce tonight's panelists is journalist Mr. Jim Sullinger. Thank you for joining us tonight, and now let's talk issues. Thank you. You know, green is more than just a color. In today's world, it's a symbol for something that is environmentally friendly. And more and more projects are built today with the impact of the environment as part of the architectural plan. Year after year, the Kansas City area turns a little greener, and a leader in that effort is Johnson County. So what's going on? Uh, how much will it cost us, and possibly how much will it save us? We've gathered three experts to talk about the environmental greening of the Kansas City area. They are Mr. Phelps Murdoch of the nonprofit organization Bridging the Gap. Bridging the Gap is an organization that uh, urges and promotes sustainability. Uh, next to him is James Yorkey. Uh, James is the Johnson County Sustainability Director. And then our last guest, uh, J. David Langford of the engineering firm of Burns and McDonald. Uh, David is a vice president of Burns and McDonald and uh, a, uh, uh, in, has something to do with envir the environmental division of, of Burns and McDonald. Uh, I want to, uh, this is a subject that frankly has just absolutely uh, interested me to no end. Uh, I keep running across more and more green type projects uh, all the way from a sewage treatment plant in Johnson County that's going to produce its own electricity and save something in the neighborhood of six hundred thousand dollars a year to uh, a little fire station that's being built in Lenexa that uses pervious concrete, a, a concrete that actually cleans the water. Uh, before it goes into a little nearby creek. Uh, parks, uh, the Johnson County Community College is making three of its parking lots green. Um, projects creeping up all over the place. In Kansas City, uh, Missouri, around 75th and Truce, there's a, pro a gigantic project that's going to be started uh, called Target Green um, uh, with a, a, a tremendous vision for the future, uh, environmental future there. So I want to turn to you all and, and ask you, why am I seeing more and more of these green projects? I'd like to start really by talking about sustainability, if we could, because it's really right the, basis, the, 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 question, the basis for all of this. Question what becomes, is sustainability? What is sustainability, and, and what are we, why, why do, how does this fit into these green projects? Well. I've been trying to talk to people about this for 28 years. I worked on the first recycling project, uh, organized recycling project in Kansas City in 1981. It's called Casey Recycling Team. And we tried to explain sustainability to people and uh, we've been doing it all that time and they get very confused. It's really pretty simple. To be sustainable, and I'm gonna use the Thomas Jefferson definition. To be sustainable, you have to live your life such that you don't pass your environmental debts on to future generations. Uh, we're looking pretty good at passing our debts on to future generations, both uh, financially and environmentally. But we're living in such a way now that we're using up our resources. Uh, we're using up non-renewable non resources, things we can't get back, oil and coal. And the process, we're spewing a bunch of nasty stuff into our atmosphere and our water that's really fouling our nest. And we got to stop all that. Uh, not only, not just for ourselves, because it's ruining our health, but really for, for the health of future generations and really the survival of the species. You know, Jim, uh, excuse yeah, me, Phelps is exactly right that the words sustainability and, and green are closely related and it just relates uh, to looking at each decision that we make and considering how those decisions of our use of resources and the way we live our lives, how it impacts uh, people, other people, our planet, the environment in which we live, and then uh, the financial aspects of those decisions have to be considered as well. So you have to balance those three things in each area of sustainability that we're going to talk about this evening as we consider different projects or initiatives uh, 
you have to consider keeping all, all three of those factors in balance. And that's really important because a lot of people, I think when they hear the word sustainability, they think about simply environmental issues, and that's a piece of it, but it's not the only piece. Right. It's really balancing those three parts of the equation, people, prosperity, and planet. Right. So the term energy efficiency is part of sustainability. It's not a term that replaces sustain the word sustainability. It's part of it. It's yeah, but it's, it. a, it's a great start because you get such a win-win-win. So if you, if you are energy efficient, uh, you reduce the amount of uh, fossil fuels you're using, non-renewable resource, but you're re at the same time, you're reducing uh, this nasty stuff that goes into the atmosphere, carbon and other pollutants, mm -hmm. and by golly, you're saving money. Mm -hmm. You know, so you stopped using something you shouldn't be using, you reduce the pollution, and you save money. That's a win-win-win. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of examples in the area of energy efficiency where you can make decisions that, that benefit all three of those factors. So why are we seeing more and more of these projects? Is it because all of a sudden there's a billions of dollars in stimulus money? that? Because uh, I've noted that some of the projects, that, uh, especially the government projects that I've run across, have uh, stimulus money connected to them. Uh, has that been an emphasis? Why are we seeing more of this? Or as a nation, as a civilization, are we becoming more conscious of the environment? And are we, be, are we in our minds becoming more environmentally conscious? I'd like to take a stab at that. Um, I, th I think we are becoming more aware. There's more public awareness of the environmental consequences of the, some of the things that we've been doing that really have not been that positive. Um, but really, the county government, Johnson County government, has been working on sustainability issues since long before the stimulus bill came out. Um, in fact, we've had a staff sustainability committee since 2004. Um, we've been doing a number of things to make our buildings more energy efficient. And those are things that we've been doing on, on our own dime because they make sense long term. When you make a building more energy efficient, what you're doing is you're reducing the cost of operating that over, over the long term. And mm -hmm. we've been around for 150 years, and we're going to be around for 150 more. And so we really have to take the long-term perspective and make sure that we're making investments in a way that reduce our costs in the long term. And so a lot of this stuff is not being paid for with federal dollars. We're using our own local revenues to do it because it simply makes sense. It provides value for taxpayers. So that level of awareness, the increased level of awareness, the uh, focus on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and those concerns as well as the addition of stimulus money uh, funding many of these projects all of those factors I think have added to uh, mm -hmm. the, the projects that you're seeing the, the more the frequency of those and just uh, it, it being encountered more and more in our daily lives of, of seeing those examples mm -hmm. I thought you hit it on the head though it is about it is awareness uh, it's becoming clear clear to people not only in businesses that are saving money by being efficient I mean, quite frankly, what sense does it make? If you make a product, uh, this was cited in the book National Capitalism. Uh, if you make a product, 95% of everything you put into that product, labor, uh, energy, water, materials, et cetera, et cetera, is lost. Out of it only comes 5% that's the actual product. What sense does that make? If you can find some way to reduce those energy, reduce the water use, reuse it, uh, use uh, other resources other than the ones that are impossible to find, you're ultimately going to save money, mm -hmm. but you're also not going to have all this waste that has to go into landfills and ends up in our streams and air and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I think people are beginning to understand that. Mm -hmm. I think another factor is uh, people are understanding that whether, it, whether it's a business building or a home, 50% uh, of all the energy that you bring into that home to heat it or cool it is lost. Mm -hmm. well, so what sense does that make? If I could reduce that to where it was 20%, 5%, how about no percent, where all the energy that came out home was useful? Well, not only would I not be wasting energy and putting all this stuff out of the atmosphere that I shouldn't be, I'd be saving a tremendous amount of money. We were in a home, I was talking to one of these gentlemen earlier this evening, we were in a home Saturday night for an event which a couple built, uh, designed themselves. It's, uh, I think, a little under 5,000 square feet, including a finished basement area. It's a nice big house. It's a wonderful, wonderful house with lots of special features, all recycled wood, all kinds of good mm -hmm. green things, sustainable things. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing to me was, I asked them about the utility bills. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, we've been here over a year now, and the average is $70 a month wow. for all utilities. 
That's a lot less than what I paid. That's where we all got to go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some of the projects. Uh, give people an idea of what we're talking about. What's being built? Uh, what's being done uh, by governments, by private uh, industry, uh, when we talk about uh, doing things uh, in a sustainable way? Uh, there's, there's so many. Um, you know, all the way from the wastewater treatment plant that's going to produce its own electricity to uh, the, like I say, these parking lots here that uh, that's going to clean the water that comes off of the parking lot. And and your firm, uh, McBurns and, uh, Burns and McDonald, is actually uh, an advisor to that project, right. by the way. Um, so, what are we seeing? What's what's kind of, and and I also what is um, what kind of projects are we are we looking at here? Well, I can talk about a couple that Johnson so, County is yeah, doing. please talk about some of the stuff we that have, Johnson County is doing. We already have uh, two right. county buildings that are certified LEED. That stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Basically means that they're more energy efficient than, than a conventional building. Um, the Sunset Drive office building, which opened in 2006, is certified LEED Gold. And it uses about 45% less energy than a comparable uh, conventional office building. And it, we built it that way because the, the payback on the energy savings more than makes up for the roughly 3 to 5% additional upfront costs that you pay. Again, when you're, when you're talking about operating that building long term, um, it, it makes sense to make the additional investment to recoup on the energy savings. So we have that one. We have the County Communications Center, which opened in May of this year. It was certified LEED Silver. We have three other buildings in planning right now including a, a juvenile detention facility that will uh, utilize, utilize geothermal heating. Just had a ribbon cutting on that, I think, just that's, a week or two ago. That's correct. We have, uh, we have a public works facility in design that will probably have an alternative refueling station for our fleet. Um, and we have, let's see, there's, there's one more project that we have in design currently. Um, it's a crime lab, actually, and we're shooting for either lead gold or possibly even lead platinum, which would be the first local government-owned lead platinum building. So we're being very aggressive about this because, again, the payback is demonstrated. And when you talk about what county taxpayers are expecting and demanding from us, they want to see us making those kinds of investments. I can tell you that if, if there were any kind of objection to our are doing this, our Board of County Commissioners would have heard mm -hmm. about it. They mm -hmm. have gotten nothing but positive feedback on the Sunset Drive office. Haven't building. you also done some surveys to, to sample public opinion on this issue too? And what, are those, what do those show? That's correct. Well, we asked, we asked folks, we surveyed about 1,300 mm -hmm. uh, county <coughs> residents to ask them what they felt about various issues, including sustainability. And they indicated uh, over 9 out of 10 responded that they felt county government should be focusing on sustainability. So that tells me that we're moving in the right direction and that our actions are consistent with what taxpayers want. Mm. Is that what, we're, what you all are finding in, the, in other parts of the metropolitan area, that, that there is a groundswell of support for this kind of construction? Well, for this interesting kind of enough, initiative? I live in uh, Platte County and I've been worked on a lot of the Platte County plan, planning groups. And when we did the county plan, oh, I don't know, it was maybe five years ago, four or five years ago, there was nothing that came up about environment sustainability. And this time, the one we finished this just this last year, uh, first part of this year, has shown uh, to have a high interest in environmental sustainability, even to the point of discussing the creation of an environmental commission for the county, which would not have been discussed two or three years ago. And the interest in, uh, tremendous interest in public transit uh, and in trails, uh, major changes since since mm -hmm. the last study. So I think it's mm -hmm. it's a tremendous change. It and is, it, Jim, you you ask about you know the types of projects that we're right, seeing, right, yeah. and, and it, at Burns and McDonald, sustainability really touches each of our ten different uh, practice areas, from energy to water to transportation. Uh, we uh, conducted a study for uh, Johnson County to help with their baseline greenhouse gas inventory to kind of set a, a benchmark of. Uh, a current level of greenhouse gas emissions so they can monitor improvements uh, and reductions <coughs> in those levels uh, in time as mm -hmm. they implement various types of efficiencies. But the projects that uh, we see being conducted by uh, public and private clients really throughout the United States and world involve uh, sustainable design where, where facilities and uh, even campuses are being uh, designed to very high lead standards, high efficiency standards. Uh, measures are being conducted on projects for wastewater facilities to uh, reduce the use of 
of water that's that's used because that's a very important natural mm -hmm. resource as well. And it's certainly in the area of energy efficiency, whether that includes uh, cleaner uh, operation of existing uh, energy production facilities or the installation of new renewable energy facilities for wind or solar applications. Uh, those projects are, are very uh, much underway at this time. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this LEED. Uh, you've mentioned uh, LEED certification. Mm -hmm. Exactly what is that? Who, who bestows this LEED certification? Uh, is it the federal government? Is it some private organization? And, and what do you have to do to get it? And you were talking about gold and silver. Right. I'm assuming gold is a higher standard than silver. Correct. Um, first of all, what does it stand for? Well, is, it, is it an acronym, uh, there, LEED? There's, there's, a, there's an organization called the U.S. Green Building Council. And basically, it's, a, it's established a set of criteria that relate to the environmental impacts of not only building a, a new building, but also designing it and then operating it after the fact, after it's constructed. And so basically, in order to certify a building according to these LEED standards, you have to go through a checklist and, and check off a variety of, of steps that you've taken that relate to where you've gotten the materials. You get points for using local materials because that reduces the transportation cost environmentally of moving them around. Um, trying to construct a building that's energy efficient, so using natural daylighting versus uh, electric lights. And, and so basically you, you go through the criteria and, and what it causes you to do is to not only design a building that is more energy efficient, but it also gets to water use in some of our buildings. You know, we have um, waterless urinals, for example. We have low flow faucets and, and toilets because that reduces water consumption. Even though water scarcity is not really a, a main issue in this area, there's a lot of energy that goes into purifying water and mm -hmm. piping it to buildings and people's homes. And the lead criteria for buildings has a given number of points for each of these different areas that James is talking about. So you would actually you know, grade a building essentially or mm -hmm. a, a new project. You could also do this for an existing building as well and the, the buildings can be uh, certified based on different levels. A building could have the lowest level, which is LEED certified, or then it can go, um, you know, silver, gold, or, or platinum level. Mm -hmm. And we're currently working at our World Headquarters campus here in Kansas City at 9400 Ward Parkway to take that existing building and implement these energy efficiency and sustainable measures to get a LEED Silver certification mm -hmm. at an existing facility. Now, do you apply for this and then somebody comes out and inspects your building and says, okay, stamp of approval? You, you do. You, re <laughs> you register the, the project, that it's something you intend to do, and then you work with uh, a team to uh, implement each of those measures, whether you're focusing on energy efficiency or water or your building mm -hmm. operation, and then uh, submit that application uh, to the USGBC, mm -hmm. and then they would uh, grant that certification. Mm -hmm. So buildings are lead, can uh, receive lead certification. Individual professionals that work on those projects receive lead accreditation. It's like a professional mm -hmm. certification. Mm -hmm. You can become an accredited professional. Mm -hmm. And these, these uh, stamp of approvals are not easy to get. Right. It's yeah. a pretty severe process. Uh, some say too tough. I don't think so. I think it's mm -hmm. great. I always like to give credit to our heroes. Over 20 years ago, a couple of architects here wrote a green guide for the American Institute of Architects, Bob Berkebile and Kirk Gastinger. And that was the basis from which the whole lead concept came from. Wow. And the, from and, and the here. US, That's right. right. Uh, Bob Berkebile, in fact, uh, this month is being recognized with the Heinz Award from the Heinz Foundation for his leadership in sustainability over wow. the last 40 years. He's a remarkable man. And Kurt, Kurt's been a great uh, contributor, too. But those two guys, developed that, that guide, which uh, they updated and has been revised several mm -hmm. times, but that really led to the whole standards for architectural sustainability. Mm -hmm. Can preservation of a natural resource be considered part of sustainability? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very impressed with uh, a project that Johnson County is involved in now, um, in which uh, they were going to put a very large interceptor sewer line right through the middle of the Overland Park Botanical Gardens. And the estimate was that to put this sewer line in, which you usually trench it, uh, would ha they would have to take out 10,000 trees to put this line, to trench this line in. Rather than do that, they have a firm that is now tunneling under 
the botanical garden, and they'll lay the pipe into that tunnel, save the trees, but yet the interceptor will go in and allow for, frankly, a, a, blood develop, a lot of development that will occur in southeast uh, Johnson County. Um, and I looked at that as a green project. Absolutely. Uh, even though it's going to cost, cost a million dollars more, um, it's going to save a tremendous amount of forested area, woodland area, in what is uh, land that belongs to the Olin Park Botanical Garden. I, I thought that was well, that was very. I'd have, to, uh, I'd have to look at the inspiring. trees. And I haven't looked that close, uh, but that might be easily a million dollars worth of trees. Easily. Oh, so that it's <laughs> easily. <laughs> and right. so, uh, plus there's a time factor. It's not just a matter of those trees are there; they had to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a whole system, and it's not just the trees. There's a whole ecosystem that's involved there. Right. Uh, people used to kid me about being a tree hugger, and I said, you know, I, trees are all right. I like them, but I'm really fond of, fond of oxygen. I love it. I, love I try to have some <laughs> every day. And those trees, I they mean, you're talking about a thousand trees. That's a lot of oxygen yeah. and a lot of uh, urban uh, heat resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the shade that comes from trees is a tremendous asset mm -hmm. uh, in saving money. Not just in beauty, but in saving money. And more and more projects like that are considering, you know, sustainability as a factor you know, when they are, are evaluated. Not only are you looking at the scope of the project or the schedule or the cost, which are conventional factors, but you're also considering that that environmental impact. So it mm -hmm. certainly is uh, much more in people's uh, awareness now. Well, Johnson County isn't the only government that is looking at uh, being more encouraging uh, for the projects that that. Uh, these governments put together. Uh, they, uh, James, uh, you have a couple of slides which kind of illustrates what's going on in the area with Johnson County, especially of why this is a priority for Johnson County. And sure. if we could look at the first slide that talks about why it's a priority, mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about that slide, James. Sure. Well, we uh, we talked earlier about the fact that when we're when we're trying to behave sustainably, we're really looking at the impact that our actions are going to have for many generations in the future. Um, secondly, we're also trying to simply reduce waste, become more efficient, and that's really, I mean, w when you think about kind of the the Midwestern ethic, that is really what we are about as a people being conservative, not wasting stuff. I mean, that's something that certainly our grandparents uh, were very good at. I think we've, we've lost that talent somewhat, but I think we're circling back. Um, so reducing waste is a big part of what we're trying to do. Um, look, taking the long view when we're making investments is a big part of it, too. Um, because again, you know, we're a county government. We're not building a building so that we can flip it in a couple of years. We're going to be living in that building and occupying it for decades to come. And that being the case, it really makes sense for us to consider what we're going to be paying for utilities 5, 10, and 20 years out. Um, and then looking at new technologies, that, you know, we're in a time right now where, where energy is really kind of the defining mm -hmm. issue of our age, right? And, and so many things are changing. So many technologies that's are changing. Correct. Things that, for example, cost a, a mint uh, 10 years ago, starting to become more reasonable in cost. Solar. Solar is a great example. Solar is a right. wonderful example of that. So, so as those technologies <coughs> develop, you know, we are we're constantly looking to take advantage of them, and to the extent that we can fit them into our building plans, that's something that we want to do. The last piece of it, which we also talked about, is that county residents are really demanding that we take this approach. I mean, there's so much support for this. And bottom line, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. And David, you talked about conducting a uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, survey for Johnson County. Uh, the county commissioners have passed a greenhouse gas resolution, actually, and we have a, a slide, our second slide, which uh, talks a little bit about that. Uh, James, give us a rundown on uh, on this resolution that sure. the Board of County Commissioners have passed. Well, this, this was passed in December of 2007, and basically there are four components to the resolution. The first is that the board uh, basically asked staff to to develop a greenhouse gas inventory for the county government. So in other words, all of our operations, mm -hmm. we were to quantify the greenhouse gas impact. Which is what you did, David. Of those. Right. So okay. we worked with Burns and McDonald to, to get that done. And then the second part of that first component is to, to reduce those emissions one-third by 2020, which is a very ambitious goal. Mm -hmm. But we're taking good steps in that direction already. The second piece of it is to make sure that all of our buildings are carbon neutral by 2030. 
Now that means that all the materials that go into the construction of the building, all the energy that is needed to operate the building, by 2030 we want to be uh, completely neutral in terms of greenhouse gases. And, and we're not anywhere close to that right now, I can tell you. Um, again, when we talk about technologies that are being developed, uh, we're going to have to rely more on renewable sources of power, things like solar and wind. We're going to have to rely on the utilities that serve us, uh, greening their portfolios so that they're providing greener power to us so we can meet that goal. And then we're going to have to have buildings that are ultra energy efficient. Yeah, the greenhouse gas inventories uh, were conducted for twofold. What one was for the uh, county operations, and the other was for Johnson County wide right. to serve as that baseline, so that uh, you can track the targets, the reduction targets that have been established. You can see where you st you started mm -hmm. and what kind of progress you're making. You can the inventory is also broken down into different areas to show where the largest impact of the emissions. Uh, what the sources of those emissions are, right? So you can know where to focus your major efforts to achieve those goals. And this is something that uh, you don't do overnight. I mean, this is something that takes years and years. Absolutely, to these are long-term goals, and it takes a focus and a vision. I think a long-term focus and a long-term vision in order to, uh, to to get where you want to go. Know, and that leads into the third point, which is that we have a community-wide greenhouse gas goal. Um, we, we did an inventory of the, all the greenhouse gas emissions in the whole county, not only from government, not only from county government, but city government, the private sector, and private individuals. So we measured all the greenhouse gases. And then the goal there is to reduce those emissions 80% by 2050. Oh. That's the kind of goal that is going to require tremendous coordination mm -hmm. across the county between the private and the public sector. Uh, among residents to to make sure that we're reducing our emissions, and those are those goals are consistent with the the uh, Waxman Markey bill that came out of the House, and also the the Kerry Boxer bill that's now in the Senate. Hey, we're not alone in this. No, we're not. That's an important point. And uh, James talked about the cooperation that's needed across the county to achieve those goals. That's one of the really rewarding things that I've observed about the whole subject of sustainability. Is many aspects of business are competitive, certainly. But this area is, is very rewarding in that uh, I see so many organizations and companies and communities that are learning and benefiting from the lessons that uh, they've learned and sharing those with other, other people. Uh, it's, it's been a, a very interesting. Yeah, you know, Phelps, what are, you, what are you seeing in other parts of the metropolitan area? Well, yeah, I'd like to talk we, about we've a, talked a lot about Johnson County. What about the yeah, rest of the area? I'd like to talk about a couple things. I'd like to get to the regional goal in a minute. But at the same time that Johnson County was working, I think Johnson County has been the lead county in the region. There's no question about it in terms of sustainable action. Uh, the lead city has been Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, before I joined Bridging the Gap, this, this was back in the fall of 2006, uh, I was asked to serve, uh, to head up one of the working groups for Kansas City, Missouri's Climate Protection Plan. You may know that the U.S. Conference of Mayors about, uh, I think, in 2005, <laughs> Uh, developed, finished a plan for a client protection planning process. And then they asked cities to sign on. I think Kansas City was 780 something to sign on. But they were in the first 50 cities to com actually complete a comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And that one was finished and submitted to the council and approved in April of 2007, uh, 2007 right. And so uh, their goal is very similar to Johnson County. So 30% reduction by 2020. Uh, I think it's an 80% by 2050, very similar program, and a very aggressive plan. Uh, some of it you think, how will we ever get there? But it's these two plans, and I would encourage anybody to go to Kansas City, Missouri's website and look them up and read them. They're, they're really fascinating because they're really clear as to what they want to accomplish. Another thing has occurred which I think is really interesting. Uh, in uh, the fall of 2007, uh, there were a lot of conversations going on, and I was talking to people at Mid-America Regional Council, where James used to be, uh, and people at the Chamber and Civic Council and others about, hey, we're all doing some green stuff, but I'm not sure we all know what we're all doing, right. and we're all going the same direction. So the Civic Council took some leadership and asked that Bob Berkebile to facilitate a group. So uh, Mid-America Regional Council, the Civic Council of Greater Kansas City, the Ch Greater Kansas City Chamber, Kansas City Development Council, Johnson County, and Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and Bridging the Gap came together to discuss over a few meetings how could we create a strategy to make this region truly sustainable. And not an easy strategy when you're talking about hundreds of governments and counties. And, and not state. something done overnight. And two states, right. which is always a problem. But out of that came a strategy to create America's Green Region. And it has five clear 
uh, strategy areas. Make a commitment, very specific commitments. Communicate across uh, all borders and all issues and share information. Uh, figure out ways to uh, collaborate at every level. Uh, conserve energy and figure out what we have to create that we don't have that will help us get there. Mm -hmm. So those five areas, I think there's about 19 goals. And really all those folks are now working at it. KCADC is developing green strategies for bringing business here and green jobs. Uh, Mid America Regional Council is doing a whole bunch of stuff. When you, and James has shown where the county has gone. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with individuals, teaching them how to be sustainable. This uh, you may have noticed my little green I button. I know your green button. Yes. Well, that's five green things, and it's our way of people. They they go to these magazines and they see here's 50 ways to be green, or here's 80 or 100, and they go, oh, where do I start? Mm -hmm. And so we said, what we gotta do is teach people five things, do five things, and if you start with those five, you will reduce carbon, and reduce pollutants, and reduce waste, reduce energy use, and save money all at the same time. And we're getting lots of people to sign on at the website. I think we've presented, presented to probably eight or 9,000 people since we started this, and We've got, I don't know, 1,800 that have signed on, mm -hmm. and they're saving about 10 million pounds of carbon, plus all the other mm -hmm. pollutants that go with it. So it's, if we can get the individuals rolling, and we get a large enough number of people doing these things, and they get it, yeah. then they're going to start voting with their pocketbooks at the store, and buying more sustainable products, and doing more sustainable things, mm -hmm. and building more sustainable buildings, and voting for candidates who mm -hmm. support sustainable action. One of the most interesting projects, I think, and one of the largest, maybe the largest, that's on the drawing boards uh, is the 75th and Troost um, Target Green. Um, there's probably a bigger name than that for it. Uh, what's going on at 75th and Troost? What's Kansas City, Missouri doing uh, well, to, at, around that area to be more, in, uh, uh, to be better with the environment? That area is generally called Marlboro. And it's the right, first, the first of uh, uh, seven to eight, depending on how you scope it out, seven to eight pilot projects, which are to bring green, uh, sustainable uh, water detention. Uh, our problem is is that uh, we're, uh, the city's under pressure from EPA and has signed an agreement uh, after five years of work with uh, the, the water uh, community panel, which I've served on, not the whole five years, thank goodness. but. Uh, they have developed a plan, which the EPA now is studying. I think they'll approve it. But it's two and a half billion dollars. Billion with a B. Billion with a B. That's a lot of money. That's if, a huge project. If we had to spend it all in that, that full amount, it would raise the sewer part of the water bill four or five times. And it, people can't handle that. Business can't handle that. So we're working to get green solutions. And that would mean that we could save 25 or 30, or maybe more, percent of the cost of those gray projects by doing things on the surface. Uh, rain gardens, swales, uh, mm -hmm. just better control, rain, rain barrels, composting, whatever. Mm -hmm. And this whole project is to clean up the water system. We've got sewage that's leaking into, mm. into the water and all that. But you're improving the neighborhood too, at the same Absolutely. process, at the same time. Right, yeah, beautifying the, pro the project is really to address the, uh, the existing combined sewer system in, in the older parts of the city. And many, many cities have faced that, where the sanitary and storm systems mm. are, are combined. And during high rainfall events, that combined mm -hmm. flow can cause problems of the outfall. Something we've done uh, as a demonstration at our uh, world headquarters campus is to install a, a series of bioretention cells to uh, demonstrate how you can incorporate a sustainable solution at an existing mm -hmm. campus to address some of that flow you know, at the source and reduce the instant impact into the storm sewer system. Mm -hmm. These are neat. So, I've seen and, you, and, you know, these are really neat. Kansas City, Missouri isn't the only area with old pipes right. and old uh, sewage systems and old uh, storm drain systems. The older parts of Johnson County has problems mm -hmm. uh, Kansas, with, Kansas with, has uh, some problems. with uh, uh, aging, aging infrastructure like that. Uh, so uh, the applications are much wider and greater than just 75th and Troost in the Marlboro right. area. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the construction techniques. We've talked a little bit about what is the definition of sustainability. Uh, the, uh, some of the initiatives that are going on in the Kansas City area, but let's talk a little bit about exactly what kind of techniques are being employed. Uh, what is pervious concrete? What in the world is a green roof? Uh, 
the one of Johnson County's buildings, for mm -hmm. example, the one of the new ones, the Sunset Building, I think, or, or was the, the communications, the communications building. Communication Center. Communication, mm -hmm. Emergency Communications Center has a green roof. I have no right. idea what that is. Um, I can tell you. Other materials, <laughs> other materials that, and, and other techniques that are being used. I mean, I, I want to get down into to uh, definitions that people can relate to, sort of. So sure. may, let's start off with a green roof, because I'm just dying to know what a green roof sure. is. What is well, that? It's, it's, it's not roof. paint. It, it isn't paint, for, for starters. It's actually a roof that has um, some kind of soil or matrix on it that you can actually grow plants in. So the idea there is you put plants up on the roof, and what that does, number one, it provides a barrier to protect against uh, thermal gain, so the building's not absorbing a lot of heat. Um, so the, the plants are actually absorbing the sunlight, protecting the building and keeping it cool. What it also does is it helps uh, the rainwater that falls on the roof run off more slowly. So Does that mean you have to go up and mow the roof? You don't, well, if you do it right, you shouldn't have to mow. Um, okay. there, there are plants that you plant up there that, uh, number one, are very drought resistant so that when, when it doesn't rain for a period, they don't die. Sedums um, are great. So sedum would be, a, you know, any kind of succulent plant like that would be a great example. Yeah, we, we installed a pilot uh, green roof again at our headquarters campus where we have a long-term mm -hmm. commitment at 9400 Ward Parkway. Right. And when we did that, we don't own the complex. We have a long-term lease there. So Burns McDonald's a committed tenant so we had an interesting relationship with our building owner and our building manager. So when we ask uh, permission to install the, the pilot area of a green roof over our main entrance canopy. Put dirt on the roof. <laughs> well, that's what we did. Uh, we, we were met with some skepticism and some caution, but uh, the project was very successful. It uh, did add a, we added a new roof uh, membrane of, and then a green roof system on top of that. It's been vegetated uh, in a very uh, aesthetic manner. Uh, the building owner actually came and saw that after it was uh, in, in place a full year. And now they've really changed their tune. They're, they, they're a very, they like the they, idea They're now. a cooperative partner now, and they're talking about it, asking us to work with them to do it over larger areas of the building. But what that does is, is reduces the amount of rainfall that enters that storm sewer mm -hmm. system. But it also acts as a tremendous insulator, I would think. Right. I mean, earth right. is, uh, you know, an earth home, for example, that I see built uh, out in the country. Uh, are some of the most energy efficient homes that you can build because right. they got earth around them. And I have to add, if you get a chance to go see the green roof at the Boulevard Brewery, uh, I don't know that it's any better than the other green Boulevard roofs. Boulevard Brewery has a green that's roof? That's right. It's, it, actually, that's an excellent uh, environmental building. Really? Uh, but it, their green roof is really wonderful, especially on the days they're serving the free beer down in there. <laughs> the that sounds good to me. Pervious concrete. Five years ago, I had no idea what that was. Uh, within the last couple of years, I keep running into it. Um, somebody explained well, again, that, pervious that, concrete, yeah. and we're talking about concrete where water doesn't just flow off of it, it drains through it. Right, typical asphalt and concrete pavement sections that we're familiar with are designed to keep water out, out of that subgrade system below the pavement. So uh, when those are installed, uh, storm water, which would have hit uh, a, a natural ground and in, in, infiltrated, runs off more quickly and when you have a lot of pavement that can cause uh, uh, stress to the existing storm, storm sewer system. So pervious pavement is a design that allows infiltration. The, the system is actually permeable and it allows a portion of the rainfall to penetrate the, uh, the pavement system and go into the subgrade and then flow through that system. Right. You have to have some cautions, especially in areas like the Kansas City area where we have a lot of freeze-thaw cycles. Mm -hmm. You have to design for that. But in the right application, it can be used to help manage stormwater runoff. Other applications are to divert that stormwater from pavement areas. That's something Johnson County Community College is doing. We've done that at our headquarters to divert flow from a, a, a pavement and route that through bioswales so mm -hmm. the material is naturally treated through a, a vegetated system. Yeah, let's talk about uh, rain gardens and bioswales. Okay, most people would have no idea what we're talking about. Please explain in, in fundamental terms what in the world is it? Why would you put a rain garden in the middle of a parking lot and what is this bioswale that you're talking about? Explain uh, that. A lot of times those terms are used just to describe the, the shape of the feature. A bioswale is a typically a, a, a more a elongated depression. That's correct. A, a bioretention cell is a larger depression in the, in, the, in the ground where previously an area may have been fertilized and watered like a typical lawn and mm -hmm. any kind of excess flow would be diverted to a storm sewer system. 
a bio no, it's, instead it's diverted to the swale that's correct it's routed through the swale uh, and then through a rain garden maybe Yes, and a high percentage would infiltrate and be treated by the root systems of those uh, native species that are planted, and then only the excess flow would overflow that system into the uh, storm sewer to, to the outfall during a high rainfall event. And you can see a great example of that at, at our headquarters. Well, you've got one. Of, you've got that we, at your we've, headquarters. We've got one of these, and that's so. what they're building here at Johns. Uh, right. Within the within another year. Uh, all of those uh, things, the rain gardens, the bioswales, and maybe even a little pervious concrete will be uh, installed uh, at the community college here. Right. Well, there's, there's really, there's not that much difference. We want to make big differences. The swale is really a rain garden. Right. It's just a long rain garden. It's more like a ditch. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the whole nature of water. these things is that you collect the water, and the water, instead of running off, and running and it, you know, and gathering up into big amounts of water, and often taking a lot of really good topsoil with it, mm -hmm. instead of running off, it seeps into the ground, is cleaned by the plants, as, as mm -hmm. we were talking, and then goes right on down into the aquifer. And our our underground water systems are really losing water at a pretty fast rate because we're running mm -hmm. it off down mm -hmm. into the stream, which goes into the river, which goes to the Mississippi, mm -hmm. which goes to the Gulf. And if you go down and look in the Gulf of Mississippi, you will see for I think it's a couple hundred miles out into the Gulf, this big brown area, mm -hmm. that's dirt yeah. that we've washed down, right. some of it from Missouri. But these, these rain gardens are amazing, because you take, I had one where I used to just came down the downspout, went through a tube under my lawn, out onto the street, and washed on down the hill in Weston. Well, now that goes into a rain garden. Rain garden is, is beautiful, plus it's got blueberries in it, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and other things you know, that, are, that are useful to, to our home. But uh, now the water goes into that rain garden, doesn't stand there very long. So that's a sustainable were, solution. They can yeah, be done I, on small scale for residential yeah. areas or larger scale for industrial complexes. And I think you were saying before the show started that uh, the water comes out so clean you can drink, you could drink the water. Yeah, you might not like the taste real well, but it, it wouldn't kill you. No, <laughs> uh, the plant, plants are amazing at, at being able to clean out uh, toxic substances mm -hmm. even. It, it's an amazing, amazing process. Well, the other, the other thing about the rain gardens is that typically, you know, turf grass, your lawn, has a root system that is about that deep. The kinds of plants that you plant in a rain garden or a bioswale are typically native plants. They have root structures that go down eight or ten feet. And so they have a much greater capacity to absorb water, and that's why they're so effective. Yeah. A little, little tidbit. The most outstanding uh, rain garden designer in Europe, and they're very popular in Europe, uses Midwestern plants. Oh really? <laughs> because not only do they work better in rain gardens, they winter better. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great message. In fact, we're trying to figure out a way to get him over here to do a competition. That's funny. Uh, that's uh, great. So that we can teach people how to make beautiful rain gardens. What are the techniques? Uh, we talked about previous concrete, green roofs. Uh, what other materials well, are, are being used in this kind of revolution? Well, there's renewable energy applications. We're seeing more and more clients incorporating uh, applications of photovoltaic systems, especially if they're located at the in high sun conditions here in the U.S. to supplement you know, part of their energy supply and more utilities that are incorporating uh, you know, wind energy and solar as part of their generation mix. So in energy efficiency is, although it may not be as visible as some of the bioretention cells that are outside the building, uh, those are very important aspects of uh, sustainable projects that are being implemented by many of our industrial clients. Uh, what about new glasses, uh, glass coatings? Uh, a lot of buildings are actually having glass uh, windows because they're poorly insulated, but even just glass removed and replaced with uh, properly coated right. and properly designed glass that actually discerns between hot and cold weather and, and the, by the angle of the light and improves uh, the, the heat uh, either retention, retention or, or getting reflection rid of the heat. Right, uh, at the right time of year. Amazing stuff. Oh yeah, the technology seems like it just changes every month, there's every year, the technologies change. There's also upgrades to lighting systems to be more efficient and produce high quality light. Uh, water efficiency systems throughout uh, the buildings to use much less water. We are currently retrofitting all of our water fixtures in the building to end up using 50% of the water, uh, have a 50% reduction in our potable water usage hmm. for sinks and urinals and toilets. And There are amazing uh, improvements you can make by pretty simple uh, applications like that. Okay. Now, the, the dollar question. Do these techniques cost more? Uh, can we calculate the savings over time? 
Uh, obviously, Johnson County has, has invested uh, a little bit of money in a number of projects. Mm -hmm. Are those going to pay off over time? Uh, what about those people that say, well, you're spending a lot of money on this and you really don't need to spend that much money. Uh, why can't we do it the old way? Um, how do you address the, the people that say, well, this costs more? Well, I think the answer there is we're not spending a lot of money, we're saving a lot of money. <clears throat> when you look at a lot of the projects that we're doing, we did a lighting retrofit project, for example, um, a couple of years ago, basically spent just shy of a million dollars to upgrade lighting systems in about 15 buildings to make them more energy efficient. The payback on that project was 3.7 years. So basically, within 3.7 years, we paid for the $987,000 that it cost to upgrade saving. the pictures. Now you're saving. So after that period, everything, all the savings are just gravy. So we're getting that money back. So this is really a very responsible use of public resources. And we've implemented a range of projects. Some of them do have a good payback. For example, we upgraded our boiler system from an inefficient steam boiler to a high efficiency condensing boiler system throughout our complex, and we're saving about 30% of our natural gas usage. Other projects we've done, like installing a demonstration photovoltaic system to convert sunlight to electricity, was done more to demonstrate that to the community and to our clients. So that doesn't have a direct payback, mm -hmm. but it had a different uh, purpose. So again, it goes back to balancing the uh, people, pl profit, and the planet. There, you have to keep all three of those factors in mind, and each, each project will have a different uh, economic mm -hmm. payback. But when you look at them all collectively, uh, they, they make financial sense and mm -hmm. environmental uh, sense as well. Right. right. Um, I was interested in the fact that uh, uh, school districts, uh, a few of them anyway, have installed uh, uh, solar panels and wind turbines. Not many, but there's a few at school buildings. Not so much to uh, augment what they're already paying for utilities, but to act as instructional uh, vehicles Absolutely. for science classes um, to to teach kids about uh, sustainability and about energy alternatives and uh, so that the kids can actually monitor the amount of electricity being made being produced by those solar panels or by the wind turbines and do projects based on uh, what they see uh, in those so so that's an instructional and educational usage of these uh, uh, techniques and, and it is, and there's great interest in that generation. Uh, that they're they're going to be affected by the decisions that yes. we're making, and there is great interest in these te technologies and the, re the new uh, renewable energy applications. Uh, so there's there's more and more of, of those applications being uh, implemented. We hope, we hope some of those those uh, people going through education right now are going to be stimulated to create some solutions because we got a major problem. Uh, we're saving a lot of energy, but we're not even close to what we have to do. We're still yeah. importing a heck of a lot of oil, for oh, example. Tremendous from, amount uh, of oil, and we from, that's uh, both countries uh, that have uh, dictators that don't right, like us. <laughs> right. So we're we're buying stuff from enemies, in effect. Yeah. So that's that's a big problem. But we're also by buying by using those fossil fuels, we're pumping a lot of stuff into the atmosphere that's really causing us health problems uh, and and other issues. And we we just can't keep doing that mm -hmm. to ourselves for the yeah. long run. Uh, I want to ask you, David, uh, because you're in the private sector. Uh, what are private? What's private industry doing? Uh, we've talked a lot about what government is doing, but what is private industry doing? And well, and, and uh, it came to my attention not long ago that the Sprint campus in Overland Park is a tremendous example of in, being environmental friendly. They, they are, and, about that. and sustainability is very much alive and well in the private industry. Uh, more and more of our clients are uh, not only implementing sustainability through various aspects of their uh, new facilities that they may construct or plant modifications, but even at the highest levels of their corporations, they are um, embracing and developing corporate sustainability plans and policies that uh, make sustainable decisions uh, a guideline or a policy throughout their organizations. It's it's something that their customers are going to be judging them for. So we're seeing uh, that throughout every uh, aspect of American business, that this is very much an important issue in, in being considered. Give some examples of, of what you're saying. Well, for example, um, uh, Southwest Airlines or American Airlines have uh, worked with us to where we've helped them develop their 
uh, corporate sustainability reports so to document the areas where they can, uh, what they're doing already, and many of those organizations mm -hmm. are doing many uh, good things for fuel efficiency and mm -hmm. uh, recycling initiatives, and then to help them establish goals similar to the uh, greenhouse gas inventory. These would be goals of, of how they can uh, achieve uh, successes in various aspects of environmental mm -hmm. uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. we, we actually so have you were talking. We were talking to a, a little earlier about the Sprint campus and how Sprint is one of the top fifteen companies. Well, actually, uh, the news you, were week, you tell, the news week about uh, that? green uh, the, the looked at the top five hundred green corporations in America, and uh, I was going through that. It came out uh, late September. And they did several factors about operations and buildings and the mm -hmm. whole thing. But anyway, out of 500, uh, Sprint was rate, rated 15th. And that's so that's a, another that's hero we ought to celebrate. They didn't build lead at their campus. They did build good buildings. But their operations are superb, and they have an excellent green team and are really working, I know, working with us and others to, to try to really mm -hmm. uh, push sustainability in, in the region. And, and governments are, are uh, putting together green teams, too. That's um, true. It's, uh, it's not just private industry, but uh, the green teams are starting to uh, blossom, you might say, uh, all over. That th they are. Governments are, uh, businesses are as well. And that's been a very rewarding aspect of my role as the sustainability director, where uh, we really developed uh, volunteer teams where people were interested in focusing on areas of water or wastewater or energy or material use and recycling. Those teams came together, shared their ideas, developed initiatives, implemented those projects, and then are monitoring the success of those. So you're seeing that kind of cooperation and involvement in every organization that wants to uh, implement uh, sustainable practices, whether it's private industry or, or government. And a number of cities within Johnson County are also taking action to make their buildings more energy efficient. Uh, city of Lenexa, City of Olathe have both done energy audits of their buildings. Um, Lenexa has done a number of things to, to mm -hmm. reduce stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. um, the city of Prairie Village has had a long-standing environmental committee. Um, the city of Miriam is uh, participating in a competition with five other Kansas cities to see which one can reduce mm -hmm. its residential energy consumption by the greatest amount. So there's really a lot happening all yeah. over the community. Yeah, I only became aware the other day that Lenexa is building a fire station out in the western part of the city and they're using pervious concrete in part of the driveway or part of the parking lot uh, to clean the water before it goes into a creek a very short distance away from the fire station. So that's just one little example of a city uh, taking the initiative. Mm -hmm. I had to put a little plug in for, uh, we were getting calls when I first came back as president of Bridging the Gap a couple of years ago. We were getting these phone calls, people asking us for waste consulting. You know, sustainability consulting, but how do we reduce our waste? So we, after a few months, formed a consulting division. You know, not-for-profits are always looking for any kind of money we can find anywhere. And we have been, we've consulted for DST. Uh, we're working on Blue Cross Blue Shield. We're doing some work with the city of Lee Summit. Uh, Federal Reserve, a major, major study for Federal Reserve, who uses a ton of paper. Uh, mm -hmm. But these, we've been able to show these companies both how to tremendously reduce their waste output and build green teams within to keep the thing going after the consultant's mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't overlook Johnson County Community College either. They've done a lot more than just They're the uh, lot, sustainable yes. pavement uh, project that's upcoming. We've worked with uh, uh, Tim Gelvin and Jay Antle in doing an energy audit of the entire campus to, to identify areas of energy efficiency improvement that could be achieved here. Mm -hmm. I should have left them out. They're one of our waste clients, too. So, <laughs> what, can, what can state, and we talked a lot about local government, what can the state and the federal government do to encourage more green construction, to, inter to encourage more green initiatives? Um, well, there's currently a program in Kansas called Efficiency Kansas where homeowners can get uh, a loan for $20,000 to make energy, to, to do an audit and do energy retrofits on their homes and then they pay that back through their utility bill. So, and actually the payback can be no more than 90% of the savings that they get each month. So folks who are interested in doing that kind of retrofit on their homes should Google Efficiency Kansas and go to the website and learn do, how to When are we gonna get a national energy policy? Well, that, was, that would be my first statement. Is, when uh, are we gonna get one We need one to pass those? an energy bill, a comprehensive energy bill, uh, if we can get past this darn health farm reform bill. Well, that's first up, yeah. That's first. <laughs> but we need to, uh, there's, there's a good process going on 
for an energy bill. Waxman-Markey was a good model. There's another model coming out of the Senate, which is not quite as good, but uh, we need to pass a comprehensive energy bill, and we need, if we're reducing carbon, everything else will begin to get in line. We'll, it'll force us into getting more uh, renewable energy options. We'll have more green jobs created in the United States. It's going to be a very good thing economically for us. And the federal government has done a lot through the Department of Energy to funnel much of the stimulus money to uh, projects to develop and expand renewable energy. So we've helped a number of clients uh, achieve, uh, receive that money and implement those projects. So there, there's a lot going on to uh, support sustainability. A lot of the, money coming for weatherization too. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like ten times yeah. as much money as we would have had. Yeah, we've been region. talking. We've been talking about. Uh, national energy policy for decades. What's your prediction? Are we going to get one in the next two, three, four years? Oh, I think we're going to get one within the year. Within mm -hmm. the year? Yeah. Okay, very good. Home construction. We've only got about three minutes left, but I want to talk a little bit about is our, what, what, what we've been talking about, sustainability, is this something that the average person can use in his home? Uh, or are we talking about uh, things that are so expensive that the average homeowner, for example, could never afford anything well, like that? Some could be. I mean, if you put in a whole new system. But there are some great deals on um, these high-efficiency uh, Energy Star systems. But I'll tell you, there's some simple things that don't cost much. Lots of insulation in your attic, number one. I got that. Got that. Lots. Fifty or more yep. are. Uh, weather stripping around your doors around your windows, better windows, better doors if you can. And then one thing often missed that really doesn't cost that much, if you just tear out the little bit of wallboard around your windows, that's your biggest leak area other than the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Fill that in with insulation, put the wallboard back, do a little paint, a little work, but not very expensive around your doors and windows, and you will reduce Save your a lot of money. energy loss. And tremendous. be aware of your energy usage. The, mm -hmm. the lights you use, the uh, temperature in the summer and winter, just uh, an awareness, I think, can go a long way. So go look up five could green you do things. A, could you do your own, <laughs> could you do your own um, uh, little household energy survey? Sure you could. And there's also a lot of helps online to help you do mm -hmm. that. So there are many resources available. Okay. Very good. Well, I, I just find this whole area just fascinating. Uh, the technology is changing, so much is changing. Uh, government is really stepping up, local government, really stepping up in this area. And it's just uh, incredible to see. Um, I want to thank uh, all three of you for being here. Uh, Thanks Phelps for Murdoch, having us. <laughs> Phelps Murdoch of Bridging the Gap, a nonprofit group that uh, pushes and urges this kind of sustainability. Uh, James Yorkey is the Johnson County Sustainability Director and uh, uh, Johnson County is doing a great job in this area, I have to say that, and you're right, they are a leader. And David Langford, uh, Vice President and Sustainability uh, Director for uh, the firm of Burns and McDonald. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, thank you. for being here. Thank you. It's been a very interesting, and, and it's a topic that uh, a lot of people don't know that much about, and I, I think we've hopefully uh, been informative and educated some folks tonight. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, our viewers for being with us. Good evening and uh, good sustainability to you.